If you would uh, turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5. Ephesians, chapter 5. We got a little bit of reading here today uh, that we're going to do, uh, but it's necessary and right for us to do it that way. So we're going to begin in uh, Ephesians 5, verse 17, uh, and reading through chapter 6, verse 4. And this will give us a context of, uh, of the words that we see here from the Apostle Paul uh, to the church. So we'll give you a second to find it. We're going to be talking about spirit-filled families and what a spirit-filled family looks like according to Scripture. It says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation or excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head, or is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So uh, the reason we read that much of, of the text is simply this. There is a, a natural and logical progression to the text. Before he talks to us about parents and children, he talks to us about husbands and wives. And before he talks to us about husbands and wives, he talks to us about a spirit-filled life. The spirit-filled life precedes being a good husband and a good wife, and being a good husband and good wife precedes being a good father and a good mother. Uh, the best thing, men, that you could give your children today on Father's Day is a good marriage. And the best thing that you could give your marriage is to be spirit-filled is to be full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it is unthinkable, actually, that we could obey verses 19 through chapter 6 and verse 4 without being filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, I would, I would wager that we wouldn't even be interested in what verses 19 through chapter 6, verse 4 says if we're not filled with the Spirit. I think if you were to ask, you know, most women today, for example, how many of you are interested in learning about submitting to your wife or submitting to your husband as to the Lord? And uh, we treat the word submit like uh, the word communism, you know. We got to fight it at all costs, you know, die over that. Uh, and, uh, you know, we as men today, I think most men today uh, would cower at the idea of being the leaders of their home. 
and taking the initiative to, to lead their families, to lead their wives, to lead their children. They would rather be passive and not assertive. They would rather take the feminine position rather than the masculine position. And I think that without the spirit, uh, all of these things simply become impossible. Uh, what the Apostle Paul is simply saying here is that spirit-filled husbands are loving and leading. Spirit-filled wives are submissive and respectful. Spirit-filled children are obedient and honorable. Spirit-filled uh, uh, fathers, they train their children, they discipline their children, but they do not provoke their children. They're not too harsh to where they provoke their children to anger or, as we're going to see later, discouragement. So it all is predicated upon uh, this Spirit-filled life being filled with the Holy Spirit. Christianity, uh, Christianity is not psychology, uh, although uh, most certainly uh, psychology has entered into the pulpit today in, in many ways. But Christianity is not psychology. Christianity is new birth. And that new birth results in new desires given to us by God. And those new desires come to fruition, or in other words, they bear fruit two ways. And that is through the constant renewal of the mind, through the training or the understanding, the instruction of Scripture, and through the empowerment of the Spirit of God. And it's a life that, that we, as, as talking to the men here today, as men, we have to commit to. It, it's, it's a different kind of life. You, you have to commit to this book. You have to commit to Christ. You have to live a life of self-denial, of taking up your cross in order to follow him, right? Jesus said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, then you can follow me. There's this, there's this constant uh, state of, of self-denial, of crucifixion of the old life, of who we were before Christ came into our lives, and this constant crucifixion of that, and this walking out of the new life, and that walking out of the new life once again is only done through this constant state of mind renewal from the Word of God and the empowerment or the filling of the Holy Spirit that enables us to do these things. Without these things, it is not expected that you would fulfill any of these commandments in verses 19 through uh, chapter 6, verse 4. So before we can talk about the text, we must talk about the necessity of being filled with the Spirit. And you'll notice that he contrasts it with being drunk with wine. He says, don't do this, do this. Don't be drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and the reason why there's this contrast is because there's, there's a similarity, if you will, between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit. Those who are drunk with wine are being influenced by, controlled by a substance other than themselves, and they act and talk differently when under the influence of that wine or whatever that alcoholic beverage is, they act differently as a result of the influence of that substance. Likewise, when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, they are under the influence of God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit, when we think of the Spirit of God, there are words that describe who He is and what He does. He's not a mean spirit, an ugly spirit, a deceiving spirit, a lying spirit, a manipulative spirit. He's not all those things. He's the Holy Spirit. And if you're following Him and if you're full of Him, He's going to lead you into a life of holiness, not a life of chaos. 
He is the Spirit of truth. And as the Spirit of truth, He's going to lead you and guide you into all truth so that if you're following the Holy Spirit, you're going to have more truth, know more truth, and be more grounded in the truth, not less grounded in the truth. It's amazing today that we, we have so many people who claim to be full of the Holy Spirit and have the Holy Spirit, and yet the more full of the Holy Spirit that they become, the less like these verses they become. Instead of becoming thankful, they're ungrateful. Instead of being thankful, they're complainers. Instead of being submissive, they're divisive. Instead of, instead of being praisers and worshipers, they're grumblers and complainers. And, and, and they become the very opposite of the very thing that the Scripture says is consistent with the person that is filled with the Holy Spirit. The words be filled here in verse 18 in the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit rather, uh, is in the Greek language it, it has this idea of a continuous action. So you might translate it in English, uh, be being filled. Be being filled. A continuous action of filling. I mean, you need to be filled every single day. It's not something that you can say, I got filled one time, it all leaked out since then, and I'm empty now. But no, you've got to be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time event. It is a, an ongoing event that is continuous in the life of the believer and that continuous filling results in the things that we're going to read about in just a moment in verses 19 through chapter 6, verse 4. The reason why the emphasis of the verse is on be being filled, this continuous action of filling, is because of this. And I thought about this and it just dawned on me uh, this morning, if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> Some things come last minute is because the nature of the flesh is constant. That's why there's this constancy of be being filled with the Spirit. Because the nature of the fallen flesh is constant. It never lets up. It never stops. You know, I've been saved, you know, uh, the Lord saved me 30 years ago. Boy, that's scary. Because that means I'm getting older. So uh, 30 years ago, the Lord saved me. Not scary that he saved me, but scary that it's been 30 years. <laughs> 30 years ago, the Lord saved me. But you know what? I still have the same nature of the flesh that I had 30 years ago. And, 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 and there's this constant struggle, this constant war with the nature of the flesh that will continue all the way until the day of my death. <laughs> And because that's a constant fight, a constant battle, therefore I need to be constantly filled with the Spirit to be able to win that battle. And if I'm not, then I'll lose the battle and the flesh will win that fight. Right? That's why Paul says, I say then, Galatians 5.16, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But then he goes on to say, for the flesh, lust, lust means desire, desires against the spirit. And the spirit, lust, desires against the flesh. There's this constant antagonism between the two that is ongoing throughout the Christian life between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh meaning your, your old, unregenerate self. The spirit being your new, regenerated self in the spirit of God. And you've got this battle, this conflict, and this conflict is every day. I remember some years ago in a certain church... I was not ministering in that particular service. I just happened to be in attendance. She stood up to testify. She was talking about the fact that she was hoping to be delivered uh, from these particular habits that she had. 
And she was hoping to come to this place of just total freedom from it. She would never have to deal with it ever again. And I was not there as the minister. Or I would have said something. But there as a, as a sitting member, there's nothing I could do. But I thought to myself, she is desiring something that does not exist. She is desiring to be in that resurrected, glorified body that will be sinless, without corruption, uh, that will be without death or decay or sickness or aging process. She's, she's looking forward to that day of the ultimate when we will be out of these, these fallen bodies that have the nature of sin within them waiting for that day to be in a glorified, resurrected body that is incorruptible, that is immortal forever. She's looking for a day when there is no temptation, when there is no trial, when there is no test. That day does not exist right here, right now. You will always have the nature of flesh to contend with. Ask Paul, Romans chapter 7. Ask Paul again, Galatians chapter 5. There's this ongoing battle that you're always going to have, men. Always. You are ca I'm, I'm capable today, if I, if I allowed myself to, I'm capable of committing the same sins I committed when I was 19. That's why it's, 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 this is a different life. It's, it's not psychology. It's discipleship. And it's this constancy of every day I die daily. Every single day I got to put the old man down. Every single day I got to put the old life away. Every single day I've got to walk in a newness of life. Every single day it doesn't end. Now he gets into, in verses 19 uh, through the uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 4, uh, the evidences of this Spirit-filled life. What, what, does, what does it look like to be filled with the Spirit? What, what are some evidences, what are some fruit we can expect out of the Spirit-filled man or Spirit-filled woman? We're talking to men mainly today. Uh, he says in verse 9 that uh, one evidence is how you talk. Right? Being full of the Spirit will change the way you talk. Speaking to one another. How? In psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. In other words, you're going to be a praiser. You're going to be a worshiper of God. You're not going to be a complainer and a grumbler and a griper and always negative. You're going to be somebody that's a praiser of God. And you're not just singing songs and hymns that we all know. You're singing spiritual songs. You're singing new songs that the Spirit gives you because your heart is full and you're overflowing with praise that you begin to just erupt into songs of praise to God. In verse 20, giving thanks, right? Not, not, giving, uh, not giving criticism, not giving complaints, but giving thanks always for all things to God the Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's this, uh, this, this overflow of thanksgiving to God, even in all, right, all circumstances, all things. And then verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Uh, a person that is full of the Spirit of God is submissive in nature. They're humble in nature. They, they're, a, uh, they're agreeable. They're easy to get along with. They're not contentious. They're a peaceable person. Uh, they, uh, they're not self-promoters. They're not self-exalting. They're not pushing themselves to the front. They defer and they prefer others before themselves. They value you more than they value themselves. They, they want what's, it's not about who's in charge here. It's about how can I serve and help. Not how can I change 
How can I change this church? How can I change these people? How can I serve these people? How can I serve this church? How can I better this church? How can I better these people, right? How can I, how can I serve alongside and help the progress of the gospel to the world? How, how, can, how can I help in making disciples, right? The, the idea of greatness in the kingdom is the greatness of serving, not acting like lords over one another. And so there's this, this humility of heart, this submissiveness of heart. It's something I wrote down in my notes that I, I feel like is worthy of sharing with you is this, is that uh, right here, verse 21, is the opposite of division, right? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. This is the opposite of division. In other words, submission brings about harmony, Submission brings about harmony. The Bible says, by pride, Proverbs 13, 10, by pride comes nothing but strife. So you take two people, they're proud, they're arrogant, they're haughty. You put them together, neither one of them is going to yield. They're just going to butt heads all, all day. By pride comes nothing but strife, contention, arguments, friction, tension. It's going to be ongoing until somebody yields, till somebody submits. There will be no harmony. So there always has to be submission that is taking place in order for there to be peace, in order for there to be harmony. There has to be a yielding that takes place. And uh, one of my favorite uh, scriptures, although you might wonder why it is, I'll tell you why in just a minute. <laughs> it, it's really, uh, it's, it's phenomenal. In Acts chapter 6, there's this, uh, this uh, complaint Listen, we have complaints today in the church. They had complaints back then too. <laughs> Amen? Boy, do we get complaints. Um, Acts 6, they had a complaint. You know why they had complaints? Because certain widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. You know, when it comes to food, people get mad quick, right? Hey, I didn't get my food. So they complain. There's, there's this legit, it's a legit criticism, right? The Hellenists are Greek-speaking Jews. They're being overlooked just based on that. So uh, the 12, referring to the 12 apostles, they, they say this. This is what they say. Okay. It's not right for us to leave the Word of God and serve tables. Our job is to preach, in other words. So we're going to give ourselves continually to prayer, to the ministry of the word. That's what we do. That's our job. That's our role. That's our function. But what we need to do is we need to choose seven men. Now think about this, folks. They're going to serve tables. It's not rocket science. They're going to serve tables. And in serving tables, this was the requirement. Choose out seven men among you who are of a good rep reputation, who are full of the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. That was the requirements if you wanted to wait on tables. Nowadays, we just throw a warm body at it. <laughs> I'm saying they had standards in, in the early church. You can say whatever you want to say, but they had some standards. And, but we're going to give ourselves continually to prayer to the ministry of the Word. You know what Acts 6, 5 says? The very beginning of Acts 6, verse 5, you don't have to look it up right now. I'll tell you what it says. It says, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. <laughs> I mean, there's thousands of people. 3,000 got saved on the day of Pentecost. There was already 120 in the upper room. And, and we read that there's people being saved daily uh, in the church. So there's thousands of people. In, and this statement pleased all 3,000, whatever, how many hundred people there were. I thought to myself, that is a miracle. <laughs> right? You can't, you can't say three words to please three people today. You know they had to be full of the Holy Spirit if it made everybody happy. And I'm telling you, that's the way a Spirit-filled person is. They're easy to get along with. They're agreeable. They're not, we're not politicians. We're not, we're not Democrats and Republicans fighting and going to war with each other. This is the church. This is the house of God. Not a place for war. There's enough devils out there to fight. You don't have to fight them in here. At least it shouldn't be that way. So, uh, give up your gr grumbling and your griping and your complaining. Uh, replace it with being filled with the Spirit. You'll praise, you'll be thankful, you'll be submissive. And then he gets into verses 22 to 33. How are we doing on time? We're doing extremely well. So, that's my assessment of it. It may not be your assessment of it. 
Give me just a few minutes yet. Uh, uh, we, we, can, we can get through this pretty well. All right, so verse 22 to 33 is quite simple, right? Basically, all, what Paul is doing is he's using the, the image of Christ and the church in saying that the Christian marriage, and it should be noted Christian marriage, right, because these are spirit-filled people, the Christian marriage is to uh, image or mirror the example of Christ in the church so that the husband is to be like Christ in the marriage and the, the wife is to be like the church in the marriage. And just like the church is never Christ and Christ is never the church, so the husband is never the wife and the wife is never the husband. So it is never true that the, the wife is the head of the husband any more than it would be true that the church is the head of Christ. So you have this mirror imaging taking place of Christ or the husband to be like Christ, the wife to be like the church. Um, for sake of time, I want us to look at verse 25. Uh, I'm going to make a, a quick point here, a very important point. Husbands, love your wives. Well, let's back up. Verse 23, for the husband is, is head of the wife. How? As, right? As also Christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So always, always realize that the, the, that while he gives an authority here, he checks that authority as to how that authority is. That authority is like Christ being the head of the church. Uh, uh, Christ is not, uh, how shall I say, kindly. Uh, he is, he, he's not a jerk. Shall I just say it that way? Ladies, is that okay? Ladies. Right? In other words, the husband is the head of the wife, not like a jerk. <laughs> he's, the, he's like Christ is the head of the church, right? So he's not head as being uh, some uh, bully, uh, forcing, right? That submission is not by force anyway. Submission is an act of the will, not an act of force. So he's not a bully, he's not a jerk, he's not a tyrant any more than Jesus is a tyrant. Jesus is not the tyrant of the church, he's the head of the church. And uh, as head, we know that what does he as the head do? He serves the church, he, he intercedes for the church, he's, the, 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 he's, he's at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. Uh, he's a server, a, a provider, he's ministering to the needs of the church, and this is the picture of the husband being the head of the wife, that he is the leader, but he's leading through serving, uh, not leading through demands and commands alone, right? Uh, there's this service that is taking place. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Again, notice, th this, is, this is fascinating, okay? And I'm going to tie another scripture into this. This is, this is probably one of my favorite things to talk about if I'm teaching from this passage. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The word love here is not have strong feelings for your wife. That's, that's not the meaning of this word. It's not eros, uh, Greek word for uh, sensual or feeling, uh, feeling driven love. Uh, a lot of people can give you eros. Um, it's not that. Uh, it's, it's not uh, storge, which is a uh, family-oriented love like you would have for your children. If there's a certain love you have for your cousins or your brother or your uncle or whatever. It's not that. It's, uh, it's not phileo, which is friendship love. Incidentally, if we were addressing women, that is how the Bible tells you to love your husband is through phileo, through friendship. That, that's friendship love. In other words, be a friend to your husband. That's what he needs. But you men, it's different. This, this one, I'll be honest, it's, it's tough. This is tough. It's, it's the word agape, which, which is talking about a willed, determined love. It is, is an act of the will. 
It is not a feeling, right? It doesn't say for God, for example, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he yelled from heaven, I have all these warm, fuzzy feelings for you. What, what, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave. He did something, right? It's an action. It's, it's doing. It's a determined. It's not because we were lovely that God loved us and sent his son. That's for sure. But he, he did it. Love, he gave, he did, he demonstrated his love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's a demonstration, it's an act, it's a doing, it's an act of the will. It is not an act of, of feelings or, uh, you know, I feel goosebumps today, so I'm going to love you. It is loving the wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. How did Jesus give himself? He died for us, right? doesn't give you goosebumps. I'm going to die on the cross, right? That, that's not goosebumps he's talking about, right? And, that, and I say that because, come on, our, our modern world today, that's what they project to us through social media and everything else is this idea that love is feelings. There's no security in love is feelings, because then you've got to always work on the pump, the, you know, prime the pump to get those feelings going. And if the feelings aren't there, the love ain't there. And the next thing you know, you fall out of love because somebody else is easier to fall in love with because they get those feelings going again. That's, you know, that's 2024. And, and that's not the kind of love he's talking about. And he, uh, I'm almost done. Colossians. Uh, Three, he says these words in verse 18. He says, husbands, love your wives. Same word. Same word is here. Love, agape, willed, determined. I will love you even if I don't feel like it. And Paul confirms that's exactly what he means. He says, husbands, Colossians 3.18. Husbands, love your wives. Listen to these words, man. Women, close your ears. You're not here. Women, you are not hearing this. Close your ears. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. You know what that means? Ladies, are you, are you closing your ears? That means there's going to be times that your wife is going to irritate you. She's going to frustrate you. She's going to make you angry. She's going to make you feel bitterness. You know what that word means? I looked it up. It means hate. It means a, a, a bitter resentment for your wife. So he says, love her, will love her, determined to love her. I will love you. Why? Because there's going to be times that you're going to feel bitter. Don't let the feeling of bitterness overcome the determination to love like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. There's going to be times like that in your marriage where you're going to hate your, you're going to feel like, feel like you hate your spouse. You'll feel resentment. You'll, you'll feel bitterness toward her. Not, not you men, of course. It's all the other guys in all the other churches today. Never, never the case here. I know that. Never, never happened. Never happened. Right? Uh, life isn't perfect. Marriage isn't easy. It's difficult to take two people and tell them to be one and make everything hunky-dory. There are challenges, and the Bible speaks to those challenges. It doesn't hide those challenges. It's very forthright with them. It is challenging. Uh, your wife may upset you, may make you angry. The point is, um, don't, don't blow up over the little things, right? If you see a mosquito, don't pull out a bazooka and shoot it. Right? It's little. Just deal with it. Don't, uh, don't, don't make a mountain out of a molehill, as they say. In closing, we're almost done. Give me five minutes and, uh, and I'll take two more and we'll be good. We've got to get down to chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 real quickly. We're almost done, I promise. Notice now he speaks to the children. Children obey. Notice he's addressing wives and he addresses husbands. Now he's addressing children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, kids, listen up. It doesn't say they are always right. 
It is, it is undoubtedly true that there are times your parents are wrong. I don't think any parent would have an issue with that, right? If you've been a parent for any length of time, you know there's times you're wrong. But it is right. The principle of obedience is right. Obey your children, excuse me, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Notice the word parents, plural, right? Uh, Mom and dad, you got to be on the same page. you got to speak with one voice. It can't be right for dad and wrong for mom or right for mom and wrong for dad. you got to be on the same page. you got to speak with one voice. you got to be a united front. You can't let your kids divide you. You can't let your kids divide mom and dad. So mom's in one corner. Mom's taking little, little, I'm not trying to pick anybody's name out here, so I hope there's no Joey in here, but mom's taking little Joey's side and dad's taking uh, a different side. And no, no, dad and mom have to be united. You got to speak with one voice in order for children to obey their parents. Uh, don't be the weak link that the kids go to to, to avoid, uh, you know, discipline for disobedience. Uh, number two, uh, verse two, honor your father and mother. So this is the attitude of the, for the obedient child. We don't want just obedient children in actions. We want their attitude to be honorable, to be respectful, right? We don't want it to be uh, years ago, uh, you know, hope you don't mind me using a kind of a little cartoon character thing. If you do, that's okay. I'm going to use it anyway. <laughs> but uh, Dennis the Menace, anybody remember Dennis the Menace? A little, you know, you see it in the newspaper, and, and Dennis the Menace was getting scolded by his mom. And his mom tells him to go sit down in the corner, and, and you know, the little cartoon bubble, it says, I might be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Right? We don't want that. We want our kids not only to obey, we want their heart, their attitude to be right. So we, we want to mold and shape their attitude to be an honorable one. And then he says, and you fathers, uh, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Verse 4, closing here in verse 4. And you fathers, right? Now he's back to the dads again. Dads, the buck stops with you. Right? How many knows in the garden... Eve ate the fruit first. Eve had this long old conversation with the devil. And you know when God comes into the garden, you know what he's, who he talks to, who he asks for? Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? Right? He looked out, he, he looked and he went to the man. He didn't go to Eve, he went to Adam. He said, Adam, where are you? He didn't say, Eve, where are you? Eve partook first. Eve had this long conversation. But he, he, he comes to the man, and it's, it's not through the sin of Eve that we're sinners. It's through the sin of Adam that we're all made sinners, right? So he, the book stops with Dad. Dad, do not provoke your children to wrath, to anger. But bring them up, right? So, so don't do A, do these two things. Bring them up. How do you bring them up? Two things, the training and the admonition or training and discipline of the Lord. Now, I think it's important to note that he says training and discipline of the Lord. Right? The, the main thing you're training them in is not how to play baseball, football, soccer, basketball, how to be a mathematician or whatever. You're training them up, disciplining them in what? In the Lord, right? You're, you're trying to turn them into a disciple of Christ, and, and that's what you're doing. You might ask this question. This is, this is probably my closing point, I think. What do you discipline for? And I think the context is clear. He gives you two, two, two times where you discipline. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. So you discipline your children if there's a clear act of disobedience. When parameters have been set and they violate those parameters, discipline should be measured out. You don't discipline your kids for being kids, for being silly. You don't discipline your kids for, uh, you, know, you know, let your boy jump in the mud puddle, right? Let him get dirty. Let him, let him have fun. Let them be kids. Now, don't let them run into the living room like that, but you know what I'm saying. Let your kids be kids. Let them enjoy their life. They're only going to be young once. Let them, let them, let them enjoy themselves. 
But if they violate a clear instruction, they need to be disciplined. The other thing you discipline for, verse 2, is dishonor or disrespect. If they dishonor, disrespect mom, dad, siblings, the pastor, the teacher, the authority figure, you discipline them. You don't let those two things go undisciplined. Those two things must be disciplined. And you have to be consistent, consistently apply discipline in those areas. And just make sure that when you do bring your children under subjection, that you yourself are under subjection. Right? If you're going to bring them under control, make sure you're under control. Don't fly off at the handle. And, and you know, you're not, again, provoking your child to wrath. Colossians brings in this fact. Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And discouraged means to, to faint, to lose heart. They give up. It has been said that for every one corrective word, there has to be five positive words. For every criticism, there has to be at least five positives, five affirmations, five that a boy. Because if, if all they remember is dad blew up, at me over this, that, that, you know, that can affect a kid for life if you lose it and you're, you're belligerently mad. I don't care if you say I love you 20 times after that. They're going to remember that image of dad blowing up or mom blowing up. But we're talking to dads today, so you're off the hook, ladies. They're going to remember that image. So don't provoke your children to wrath lest you cause them to be discouraged and they develop this attitude of I can never please dad. I'll never be good enough. I'll never be accepted. That's why you see so many people still trying to get the acceptance of dad. I mean, they're grown men still trying to get their acceptance. Let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, thank you for the scriptures that, that teach us clearly, concisely these matters. Uh, Lord, help us today as, as men to be the men you've called us to be as spirit-filled men. Help us to be loving, leading husbands. Help us to be teaching, discipling, training, and disciplining parents or fathers uh, without provocation to anger or wrath, not discouraging our kids, not belittling them, not making them feel small, uh, but, uh, but giving them the, the positive encouragement that they need as well. And Lord, help us to be, uh, to be balanced in these things and to just follow the clear example as men for us to be like Christ in our home. And if we just, if we just think of that, I'm going to be like Christ in my home. What, what, what could possibly go wrong with that? that? That is exactly what every woman would want. We love you, Lord, and appreciate you in Jesus' name. Amen.